I was lost and all alone into the martial lands on Hell. A journey to victory has begun! Death to the MPLA! Fellas, it is finally time. It is finally time for us to trudge through Loyalty Among Worlds, the Amphibia fanfiction written by Admiral DT8. For those who want additional context, check out part 1 of the series, but for those who need a quick reminder, Admiral DT8 is a 29 year old artist, animator and fanfiction writer who is notorious in the Amphibia fandom for his Amphibia fanfiction, Loyalty Among Worlds, which is a retelling of Amphibia starring his OCs. Daryl Loyaliate, Tint, and Kronax Tormak. The fanfiction itself is considered to be one of the worst fanfictions in the fandom as a result of the ship featured in the fanfiction, and being paired with Daryl. If this was a little kid making an OC to ship with their favourite character, then we would not be here, because as it turns out, Daryl Loyaliate is a self-insert of Admiral DT8 himself, ergo he's shipping himself with a teenage girl. This has led to him being near universally mocked in the fandom, with people regularly making fun of him in his artwork, which itself isn't exactly that great. But that aside, is the fanfiction really as bad as people say it is? Well, only one way to find out. Before we start, I'd like to get some disclaimers across. Firstly, this video is going to be reviewing the fanfiction as if though Daryl is a legitimate 13 year old boy and not the self insert of a 29 year old man. Secondly, I will review and summarise each and every chapter to the best of my abilities with images on screen to depict the events of a scene if possible. Thirdly, much like the previous video, please do not harass Admiral DTA or his friends or supporters as that solves nothing. Fourth, the first chapter of this fanfiction is designated as Chapter 0 instead of Chapter 1, meaning that it gets a little confusing to follow along, but not for long. Fifth, this video assumes that you've already watched the show. If not, then pause this video, watch Amphibia and come back, because if not, then you'll be doing so at your own discretion and a lot of things will not make sense. Sixth, Admiral DT8, if you are watching this, and I emphasise this seeing as how you react to negative criticism, this is not a personal attack on you or trying to get people to harass you. This is merely me giving my thoughts and opinions on your work, so take this as feedback. Without further ado, let us begin. The first chapter begins with a spiel about wanting to be the best or shining cog of the clock that keeps time in check, before we are introduced to Daryl Loyaliate, his second name being German for loyalty, a bit on the nose don't you think? A 13 year old boy who edits videos as a hobby under the pseudonym Astrofell, the videos he creates are popular at school though they are unaware that Daryl is the one who makes them. It is also established that Daryl is in a relationship with Sasha Waybright and is also friends with Anne Boon Choi and Marcy Wu, having known them since kindergarten. At first, Sasha and Daryl's relationship went smoothly before deteriorating to the point of Daryl being used by Sasha, but Daryl relies on Sasha for protection and her popularity so the relationship remains. I think by now you're beginning to see the first problem already present itself within the first chapter, and that he is he over relies on exposition. A common rule when it comes to writing is show don't tell and this chapter fails at that massively. Right from the get go we have a massive exposition dump about Daryl and everything about him which makes the first half of this chapter a fucking chore to get through. We could have had it begin with Daryl finishing up the video he made, uploading it to whatever website he uses and watching the positive reception flow through. It's not exactly perfect but it's far better than an exposition dump but I digress. Daryl got up, did his morning routine, got on his bike and headed for school. He is excited because today is Anne's birthday and she's turning 13. And now the second problem presents itself. There isn't a new line for a new speaker. This fundamental flaw makes it much more confusing to read than it otherwise would have been. Just take a look at this and ask me who's speaking. His mother. Yeah, it's confusing and it's present throughout the entire fanfiction. Fucking hell. Anyway, Daryl arrives at school to overhear students talk about his videos, and this is what I mean by the formatting being bad. Like, who's talking? Is it the same person? Are they both having a conversation? Who randomly brings up Anne's birthday? Continuing on, Daryl met up with Anne and wished her a happy birthday, along with asking her, What kind of culinary treats do you have today? Yeah... 
and told him that this is a cow Mew Bing before Sasha arrived to wish Anne a happy birthday and to say hello to her boyfriend. After they danced for a bit, the school bell rang much to Sasha's dismay. Midway through the lesson, Sasha decided that she, Anne and Daryl are going to skip. Daryl recalled how his parents told him that he'll amount to anything if he puts his mind to it and that right now he wanted to join Anne's birthday celebration with her family. Good lord this writing. A while later, he ran into Sasha and Anne whilst on his way to the toilet, with Sasha telling Daryl that she and Anne intended to skip school to celebrate Anne's birthday in style, quote unquote. In response, Daryl felt edgy. Oh my god, Daryl, don't say that, that's racist! Oh, uh, he, he meant on edge. Oh. Uh, oh, alright then. He reminded them that they nearly got into trouble on his 13th birthday, but Sasha quickly brushed it off before she boasted that it'll be the best birthday in their history of birthdays. After doing a bunch of stuff until 6 o'clock, at that point Anne said that she wants to go home now and Daryl offered to help her get there, given how he felt responsible for helping Anne skip school. But Sasha being Sasha declined that and she wanted to keep it going despite Anne and Daryl's wishes. Daryl tried standing up for Anne but Sasha quickly shut him up before she turned to Anne and said that their plan to meet with Marcy is final. Daryl just couldn't believe the absolute tragedy he was witnessing. Sasha peer pressuring Anne, oh dear! Oh, the humanity! Anyway, the new chapter ends with Daryl feeling guilty about the whole thing as Anne stole the music box, which has an additional fourth gem. Anne opened it and the quartet got transported to Amphibia. This chapter isn't that bad, but it is by no means a good start at all. Massive exposition dump at the beginning already lowered my expectations for the rest of the story, and the dialogue didn't really help matters. We don't really get much of Daryl and Sasha's relationship, we don't get much of his friendship towards Anne, and his friendship with Marcy in this chapter is non-existent. But it's the first chapter, so who knows, it can only go up from here, right? No. The artwork is actually pretty well done, like credit where credit is due, he actually did a good job at making the edits look like actual screenshots from Amphibia. Overall, this chapter gets a 3 out of 10. <laughs> chapter 1 of this fanfiction begins with an introduction to the Salamanders, Tint and his uncle Cronax. These two are searching for the Eternal Staff, a staff rumoured to have an insane magical power that can only be found by someone with a pure heart. Tint asked Cronax why he even bother searching for the staff if he told him that he already has the same power as the staff, to which Cronax acknowledged, but reminded Tint that they are finding it for educational purposes and to sense some magic or something, I don't fucking know. We then cut back to Daryl, who had his uniform torn up and dirty, with two twigs in his hair that made him look like a deer. He also crafted a spear to try and pick off fruit from trees. To try and relieve his stress, he ran off into an open field with fireflies and oh, okay, this, this looks, this looks kind of nice, not gonna lie. He then pulled out the Polaroid photo of the main trio alongside a Polaroid photo of him and Sasha before he reassured himself they'll find them and away home. Meanwhile, Tint and Cronax have been hearing rumours about someone that looked like a deer but it stood on two legs and with limbs the size of twigs. Later, whilst trying to grab a piece of fruit from the tree, Daryl encountered Tint who prepared to attack him before the latter calmed it down by telling him that he meant no harm and that he was also hungry. After they introduced each other, they had some small talk to where Daryl came from and that Tint's uncle may be able to help with that. Some cheesy dialogue later and chapter 2 concludes. Aside from the grammatical errors like before, this chapter isn't exactly that interesting, but not too bad. And credit where credit is due, the artwork does look pretty nice. I do like the Polaroid photo of Daryl and Sasha. Dare I say it looks oddly cute? Kind of? I don't know. Regardless, the chapter gets a 2 out of 10. The chapter starts with Cronax being worried about Tint's whereabouts. He remarked, He should never feel left out just because he has magical powers, especially what happened to him and his parents. I wanted to believe that what happened to them was just a bad dream, but it wasn't, and I hope he can understand soon. Oh, this guy is only just gonna get worse. Cronax was then relieved to see Tint, but his relief turned into worry upon seeing Daryl, and thus used wind magic to blow Daryl away. After Tint assured Cronax that Daryl wasn't a bad guy, Cronax then agreed to help him as long as he can help him in their quest. Meanwhile, Daryl rolled into a leaf in old spider silk, which somehow made a blue cloak. Suddenly, our hero then heard whispers and followed them, which eventually led to the eternal staff and pulled it out, his eyes flashing red briefly. Wow, who could have seen that one coming? Tint and Cronax catch up to him and are amazed that Daryl was the one who pulled out the eternal staff. 
Once Daryl snapped out of his trance, he queried about the Eternal Staff and was introduced to Kronax, who gave him a lecture about Amphibia and the creatures who live in it, and told Daryl that he would find out why the staff chose him, quote, in due time. On their way back, Daryl decided to sing a song that I am not going to be playing, and his staff turned blue as a result. After they arrived back at the Salamander Hut, Tint and Kronax told Daryl to basically make himself a home before the chapter ended with Daryl saying, and I quote, Girls, I hope you are okay, because I am. Man, fuck this dialogue! Grammatical and tensing errors aside, this chapter was boring. Whilst the Eternal Staff was a cool idea, the way Daryl found it or is led up to in this chapter was not. Though, in Admiral DTH's defence, this chapter was written prior to it being revealed that Anne's Calamity Gem meant heart. What I also would like to bring up is that Admiral DT8 wrote in the first person here, which lends more credence to the notion that Daryl Loyally 8 is a self-insert of Admiral DT8. Anyway, the artwork does look pretty cool though, I'll give it that, but still, the chapter gets a 2 out of 10. The chapter begins with Daryl having woken up and eating breakfast with the salamanders. He said some corny shit before he took a bite of his omelette. He showed two Polaroid photos, one of the Canon Calamity trio, and another of him and Sasha. He explained his history of Sasha from when they first started dating in elementary school to their relationship having deteriorated by the time they got to middle school, and how she became manipulative. Afterwards, he gave a brief rundown of how he arrived in Amphibia and drew a rough sketch of the Calamity box. Kronax noted that he recognised it, but just can't pinpoint it exactly. Wow, he knows something that we don't. Later on, we get a flashback to Daryl and Sasha on a day at Tai Go, which is Anne's family restaurant. After the couple had their meal and it was time to pay, Sasha bolted right out of there, leaving Daryl to explain to Oom um Boon Choi, Anne's mum, as to why they haven't paid. Oom um understood that it wasn't Daryl's fault and allowed Daryl to contact Sasha's parents to sort it out. Psych! As it turned out, Oom um is angry at Daryl, not Sasha, because... Daryl couldn't explain what happened or something? This is out of character, what the hell? Anyway, whilst Daryl is made to wash up dishes, Anne offered to help him, and so she taught him how to do so. Daryl then cut his hand on a knife to which Anne got a cold paper towel and cleaned Daryl's cut before she patched it up, holding his hand while she did so. Daryl thanked Anne for that, though he wanted to hold hit Anne's hand for a little longer. Oh my god, it's already beginning! Daryl and Tint were dusting the shelf before Tint slipped and fell off with Daryl trying to catch him, but just before Tint reached the ground, red mist began forming under Tint and he started levitating just before he hit the ground. Tint yelled that Daryl is now doing magic and instructed him to slowly lower him to the ground via lowering his hand. Daryl did so. Tint then explained that it was the Eternal Staff that allowed him to do this before Kronax walked in and instructed Daryl to call the staff via closing his eyes and concentrating. Daryl did so, and lo and behold, the staff flew right into his hand. Afterwards, Kronax taught Daryl to perform vision magic via closing his eyes and pretending that he's holding a bowl. After Daryl did just that, a ball of light formed in his hand, and with that light was Anne and Sprig. Why didn't Daryl prioritise finding Sasha first and foremost, considering that she is his girlfriend after all, and then finding Anne? I don't know. But regardless, the chapter ended with Tint and Kronax telling Daryl that he'll need to refine his magic and train should Daryl want to find his friends and go home. This chapter, much like the last, was pretty boring. Aside from the poor formatting and grammatical errors, there wasn't exactly much to this chapter aside from Daryl learning how to do magic, which was kind of cool I guess, but that's about it. The artwork gives a sign of things to come, as oh my god, we're only at the third, technically fourth, chapter, and he's already reusing poses. Tint's pose is reused from this piece here, and the rest of the artwork isn't really exactly much to write home about, other than Admiral having taken the promotional poster for Amphibia Season 1, cropping it, and placing it in this orb. But hey, maybe next chapter we'll have Daryl learning his powers alongside Tint and Kronax, or going into all sorts of magical shenanigans along the way, right? No. This chapter gets a 2 out of 10. Fuck it out. And what do you know, after only spending three chapters in this location, we are immediately abandoning it since Daryl now knows that Anne was in this world, and, if he wasn't mistaken, so were Sasha and Master. He decided to find Anne first and foremost, given that she was the one with the Calamity Box. One short exposition dump later, and Daryl plus the Salamanders now prepared to head to Waterwood. But forget to walking, given that the terrain, much like a cannon, is impenetrable at this time of year, they are going to use teleportation magic to get there. After having prepared everything, Daryl then closed his eyes while Kronax spoke Agent Salamandrium Tongue, and some wind blows and bright flashing later, they were now at Waterwood. 
pulled out the two Polaroid photos. He looked at Anne before he looked at Sasha. He then thought back to the times the latter mistreated him whilst the former actually looked out for him and made him feel happy. Now, remember in the last video where I said if he doesn't trace parts of, or an entire pose, he just steals the renders right off the wiki with some minor edits. Well, here he is doing just that. He just takes Anne and Sasha's renders, decapitated them, lowered the opacity and slapped them on it. Just... Ugh. Afterwards, Daryl carved a D plus A into a tree, probably to reflect his eyes being open or something, with Cronax commenting, Winston knows that relationships can change over time. Courage knows that when it's time to change a relationship. He do be speaking facts, but like, you could have made it sound less awkward. A while later, the crew arrived at Stumpy's diner and said that it looked a lot like it lost its charm, given that this takes place prior to Lily Pad Thai, in which Anne rejuvenated the place. And right after Daryl says, Everyone, a toast to the world of Amphibia. Oh, Jesus Christ, saying that just makes me want to fucking rip my eyes out. We get another song number that I am not playing, with the staff turning blue as a result. This attracted the attention of numerous patrons in the restaurants and from outside the restaurants, including none other than Anne Savisa Boon Choi herself and the Plantons. You could tell by the blatantly stolen Anne Boon Choi render in this first few pieces as well. It was then that not only Anne reunited with Daryl, but it's also revealed that he had previously consumed a devil's fruit from one piece because Christ, those arms are long. Like, what the actual fuck, man? Anyway, Anne introduced the planters to Daryl, and Daryl introduced the salamanders to Anne. Daryl and Anne asked Hop Hop if Daryl and the salamanders could stay at the planter farm. Hop Hop agreed, but as long as Daryl and the salamanders helped around the farm. Once they arrived at the farm, Daryl asked Anne if he could come in the basement. She agreed before Daryl showed her his newfound powers, such as Hydro. Uh, wait, Hydro can. Since when? When did he know how to do hydrokinesis? Did, did he get it off page? How? Anyway, Daryl asked if the planters know anything about the box. Anne said that they don't before Daryl revealed that the salamanders do indeed know a little bit about the box, but not much and it's best they keep it hidden until the time is right. Cue Daryl leaving the basement and arriving next to Bessie's barn, saying how good Anne is, and that concluded chapter 4. This chapter was only slightly better than the previous three, but not by much, and the artwork definitely doesn't help matters. You can see here that in his lazy attempt to copy and paste poses, Daryl has a third hand, and the quality between the edited and the original screenshot is incredibly obvious and jarring. The Anne x Daryl ship is starting off okay. There isn't really much to say about this other than the pacing is alright. Grammatical issues are still present, a dialogue makes me want to throw myself off a bridge. Oh, and the fanfiction's only gonna get worse from here. 3 out of 10. Before I start this chapter, I'd like to just add that for chapters based on Amphibia episodes, I'm going to skip a large portion of it unless the parts that are noteworthy, because I'm going to assume that you've already seen Amphibia. On with the chapter. The chapter begins with Hop Hop praising Admiral's OCs, shocker, I know, before we cut to Anne, Daryl and Sprig playing baseball with Daryl as the catcher. After their little game resulted in Sprig's hat being sliced, they heard meowing across the forest which they went and then investigated. They then come across a cat-like creature being attacked by wasps. Daryl began firing shadow bi- what? How? And what? how is he getting these random spells? It said it was because he was trembling in fear, so self-defense mechanism? Anyway, Anne is really happy because a cat bore resemblance to her cat from Earth, Domino, and thus decided to name her Domino 2 and wanted to adopt her. Sprig and Daryl were apprehensive, the latter explaining that they have no clue what it could morph into. From then on, it went more or less the same as canon, except that it was Daryl who had the conversation with Hop Hop, not Anne, and when Domino 2 began biting Sprig's leg, Anne brushed it off as her just teasing whilst Daryl was concerned, because, you know, he's always right. Anyway, after Domino 2 was snuck into the Plantar household, Cronax took Daryl and Tint to connect with nature to refine their magic. Tint told Daryl that Magic exists in many forms that can surround life itself. Magic's not a practice, it is a living, breathing web of energy that, with our permission, can encompass our every being. You want more cheese with that burger? Anyway, Daryl then spotted a caterpillar similar to Domino 2 being taken away by the wasps. He urged Tint and Cronax to help them, only for Cronax to tell Daryl that it was a coastal killer pillar that preys on amphibians once they turn into butterflies. Realising that the Plantars and Anne are now in danger, Daryl immediately rushed home, but it was too late. Domino 2 already began wreaking havoc. Anne tried to get Domino 2 to stop, but she continued and ended up knocking a bunch of boxes onto Daryl, pinning him to the ground. Oh no! Whatever will he do now? But suddenly, 
Daryl remembered what Tint told him about magic encasing our every being and began to concentrate, causing the boxes to levitate. Wow! He spotted Anne being cornered by Domino 2 and rushed to save her. He yelled at Domino 2 to stop, causing the staff to turn green and Domino 2 to sit down. After Anne apologised to Daryl about how he was right all along and I should have listened. Shut up, bitch! Daryl broke the spell and Anne tossed the toy mouse away with Domino 2 following it. And also Kronax told Daryl that thanks to his bravery, he managed to unlock beast taming powers. The rest of the goes the same as canon, except that Sprig and Daryl made the Domino 2 plushie for Anne. The chapter then ended with Kronax taking Tint and Daryl to a field to train. Oh sweet! Does that mean we get to see it in the next chapter? I sure hope so! This chapter was lame. It took a pretty nice episode and added really nothing to it other than Daryl stealing Anne's thunder and Daryl always being in the right. The artwork isn't exactly any better, with the quality being inconsistent between the original screenshot and the edit, as well as Daryl having his daylight colour scheme in this one. 2 out of 10. It's the episode taking charge for those who are wondering. Oh, and this chapter starts off with a training scene that was mentioned previously having already been completed, and so they're just dilly dallying around the plants of farm. Daryl is bored and explains to Hot Pop what he does in his free time, usually with Hot Pop trying to entice him with some books. Suddenly, Anne screamed as a result of a new Suspicion Island season, realising that it finished downloading onto her phone when she got transported to Amphibia. Daryl recalls when he, Sasha, Anne and Marcy watched Suspicion Island back on Earth with Sasha having sat next to Daryl. He then said he wanted to share these moments close to you. Much like the episode, Hot Pop disliked this and tried to show them quote unquote real entertainment, much to the group's boredom. Just before Anne started the episode, she told Daryl, We're creating special moments where you get to watch the first episode when you see them. My god, can you stop with this camp house bullshit? Anyway, after the group Sam's Hot Pop watched more than an episode of Suspicion Island, it was time to sleep. Before going into the barn, Daryl thanked Anne for hosting the Suspicion Island watch session. Anne appreciated it and asked if he'd be down to watch more episodes tomorrow. Daryl replied, Depends what I have planned for tomorrow. Bit blunt there, don't you think? The next morning, Tint and Kronax wake Daryl up as they're preparing to go on a hike to the Misty Peaks to gain elemental strength for the eternal staff near the Zappapines. Who Anne being upset about her phone, running out of battery, and there being a huge argument about who used the phone. Daryl then suggested going to the aforementioned Misty Peaks to get Zappapines to charge her phone. Cut to the scene of them at the Misty Peaks, Daryl and Salamanders managed to cross the bridge with some difficulty, but unlucky for Anne and the planters, the bridge collapsed and they fell down. Instead of using levitation magic, Daryl and the Salamanders come down to help them. Why can they just use his levitation powers to help? I have no clue. After saying some more cheesy bullshit, they then spot a colony of Zappapedes and instead of, you know, Daryl's levitation magic, they devise a plan to make a human plus frog ladder to get down and reach them. It was then that Hot Pop admitted that he was the one who used the phone, and Kronak said he knew that. Okay, you know what, I'm starting to really fucking hate this Kronak dude. They then form the human ladder, everyone gets electrocuted, Daryl was knocked out briefly but regained consciousness, and boom, both his and Anne's phones are now at a thousand percent battery. Cut to a few hours later in the planter farm, and with the amphibians having now fallen asleep, it was just Anne and Daryl watching Suspicion Island together. Daryl then fell asleep on Anne's shoulder. She found it cute, but then reminded herself, What am I thinking? He's Sasha's boyfriend. Still, is it wrong to crush on your friend's boyfriend? No shit, Sherlock, it's wrong. It mentally destroys you and it leads to all sorts of issues. Anyway, this chapter was just bad. Bad dialogue, bad characterization, and the same old issues persist. The artwork isn't exactly awful, but there isn't really nothing to write home about. 2 out of 10. This chapter is the adaptation of Anne Theft Ardo. Let's see how this goes. The chapter started off much like the same as canon, except when Hot Pop presented the book, Daryl and Kronax actually sided with Hot Pop because of course they do. But Anne ain't reading all that, so she, Daryl, Sprig and Tint took Bessie for a test drive anyway, which led to them going off-road and Bessie getting stuck in her shell. Anne suggested that Daryl use levitation magic. Why hadn't she suggested this in the previous chapter? I don't know. So Daryl tried that and she did not budge. Tint's explanation was that For the levitating spell to work, the caster must link minds of whom he casted. Bessie's mind, however, is tucked in deep within her shell. She's not going anywhere. Anne then asked Sprig and Tint to go over to the farm and get a hot pop. Daryl offered to stay with Anne, of course, and Anne agreed. 
Daryl later suggested that he and Anne read Bessie's book together. We then cut to a flashback to when the kids were in kindergarten. Daryl was struggling on how to read and so Sasha introduced him to Anne as she could apparently teach him how to read. Whilst this is inaccurate given that Anne was the one who struggled with school the most, this was written prior to it being confirmed so I'll cut Admiral DT at some stack on this one. After some corny stuff happened, they were now face to face with Bessie's natural predator, Hedgehogs. The two managed to wake up Bessie, mount her, and then sped away with the hedgehogs following her. Anne fed Bessie berries while Daryl used ice magic. How? Anne managed to freeze the trail, allowing them to escape the hedgehogs. Anne called Bessie Queen of the Road, with Daryl going on to call Nia's monologue about Anne's quick thinking saved them and she's amazing. <laughs> Chapter ends like in canon, nothing much to see here, other than that being revealed that Tintin Cronax can communicate using telepathy, without any explanation whatsoever and as to why they couldn't have done that before when they were searching for the Eternal Staff. This chapter, given the way I summarised it, was incredibly boring. The flashback was interesting, I'll give it that much, but there isn't really much in the way of anything really. There isn't really much to say about the artwork, it just looks okay, it's just that Tim is absent in this one. 2 out of 10. The chapter begins with a brief rundown of Daryl's available powers, levitation, vision magic, and the ability to control the classical element like, since when did he learn that? Oh, and illusions, which were also weren't brought up before. Anyway, we have the group just chilling until Anne broke out the basement screaming because she has pimples. She felt like out of crowd because she was already treated like a monster in Wardswood as we cut back to Anne being mocked in the streets of Wardswood. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say Anne? I meant Daryl was getting mocked in the streets of Wardswood. Regardless, Anne was feeling pretty bummed out about her pimples, that was until Daryl used illusion magic to hide them. Yippee! Problem solved! That was until the spell wore off, but to everyone's surprise, people in Waterwood liked her. She gets all famous and shit, you know, the episode. However, when Anne's pimples disappeared for real, they end up using berries like in canon instead of, you know, Daryl's illusion magic. It is also revealed that, whilst Tintu Kranax were teaching him magic, Daryl did not know that fire and water evaporated into a cloud. Dumbass. Blah blah blah, same shit as canon with Anne she doesn't care about the fame and fortune, blah blah blah. The chapter then ended with Daryl himself getting a pimple. There is almost nothing to say about this chapter, it's boring as hell. The first piece of artwork for this chapter is your run of the mill Admiral DT8 screenshot edit, nothing exactly wrong here, this one's just crap. Anne's render is taken directly off the wiki with some battle for Dream Island type face that makes her look super off and the colour scheme is black as well. 2 out of 10. This is the first chapter since chapter 3 that is entirely original. The chapter begins with Kronax asking Daryl to fetch some milkweeds for a potion that he's brought. Just before he could leave though, Daryl is asked by Hop Pop to finish hoeing the lawn. He does a great job, because of course he did. Daryl prepared to depart, but not before Anne gave him a compass and a small hug, as well as talk about how much they miss their families, and with that, Daryl sets off for the milkweeds. It didn't take long for him to find some, but just when he was about to leave, he heard a groaning noise and went off to investigate. There was a female dragonfly having laid some eggs and that groaning was her death rattle. Just before he was about to leave, a large lizard came to eat the eggs, despite Daryl having fending off the nature magic, kind of a power out of nowhere, all but one of the eggs has been consumed by the lizard, albeit with a crack. Using magic to repair the crack, Daryl prepared to take the egg back from the farm, however, midway through his trip back, the egg then hatched into a small larva which immediately molded into an adult, which makes the entire concept of a larval stage meaningless. And much to Daryl's annoyance, the dragonfly ate the milkweed. Daryl then went back to the farm and explained to Kronax that the first batch of milkweeds he collected got eaten by a dragonfly. Kronax then thanked Daryl, but not before he mentioned that milkweeds are apparently dragonfly's favourite food. Really? You're telling me that milkweeds are a dragonfly's favourite food? You know, the plant that is incredibly toxic to most animals? is apparently the favourite food of a carnivore? Stop the cow! <laughs> Stop the cow right now! Admiral DTA even claimed to have done his homework, yet a simple Google search says otherwise. Yeah. Anyway, the next day, Hop Pop and Daryl were cleaning out the former study, with Hop Pop noticing that Daryl was into dragonflies and warned him about them, mentioning that they pick up frogs and those frogs never come back, to which Daryl brushed off those warnings. A little while later, having completed the tasks of the day, Daryl took some milkweeds and sat out in the open just to check to see if the dragonfly was still around, and sure enough, it did arrive, making its presence known to Daryl and backed him up against a rock, before he puked the milkweed onto his lap, and then gestured Daryl to eat it. Daryl did so. 
After a while, Daryl named him Clipper due to him frequently clipping his jaws. But unfortunately for Daryl, he couldn't keep Clipper given Hot Pop's policy about pets, unless of course he could find a good reason to keep him around. Cut to the next day with Daryl having fed Clipper some fresh milk weeds. Then, Clipper gestured for Daryl to ride him. Pause. Daryl did so and they flew around the valley really, really fast. And when Clipper came to a stop near a water hole, Daryl was flung off and landed in some water. Afterwards, Daryl proposed to One-Eyed Wally that he and Clipper can deliver some vegetables to him in quote, record time. Wally agreed and lo and behold, the delivery was a success. Daryl then revealed Clipper to the rest of the group, citing him being able to deliver goods as a reason to keep him, alongside offering a free ride. And guess who accepted Daryl's offer for a free ride? Surprise, surprise, Anne was the only one who accepted his offer. The two go on for a joyride, with Daryl not noticing that Anne actually held onto his side. Once it got dark, they descended back down to the farm to the praise of Hot Pop, who heard from Wally that Clipper is great at delivering things and thus can stay with them. The chapter then ended with Daryl, Tint and Cronax and Clipper sleeping in Bessie's barn. This chapter was pretty interesting. The idea of a dragonfly being added to the main group was pretty cool and the scene in which Daryl got to know Clipper was pulled off pretty nicely if not somewhat flawed. Still, usual issues aside, the dialogue wasn't exactly that bad either. If anything, the only complaint other than the usual ones was that Daryl didn't do his research, like I said. And the artwork, well, it's reused poses Sans Clipper, and their faces look disproportionate to this one, and also the title of these chapters are meant to mimic those akin to the Owl House, but it really calls that. But overall, this is probably the best chapter out of this entire fanfiction so far. By no means fantastic, but it's not bad. 4 out of 10. The chapter begins with the group working at the planter farm, with Sprig suggesting an idea to Hot Pop, only for him to ask that Sprig put it in the ideas barrel. Polly questioned if Hot Pop actually listened to their ideas. They smelt something burning, and the group found out that Hot Pop was burning all their ideas because they were apparently stupid. Daryl told Hot Pop that he grew up in a country in which everyone spoke masses, proving to the readers that he's a true and honest patriotic American citizen. God bless him. Cronex then told Hot Pop, A good leader inspires people to have confidence in their leader. A great leader inspires people to have confidence in themselves. The rest of the episode goes almost exactly the same as canon, and there's next to nothing to say about this one, so let's skip to the part in which they find Hot Pop. Daryl prepared to sneak out to find Hot Pop, only for Cronax intent to catch him. They joined him, and with the power of vision magic, located Hot Pop and arrived via Clipper, finding him with a group of beetles. Oh, Anne and Polly catch up to him afterwards. They convince Hot Pop to return, he and Sprig have a rematch and Hot Pop wins, and Control of the Farm is returned to him, promising that he'll actually listen to their suggestions. Cronax said, It seems that a good leader has become a great leader after all, referring to Hot Pop. <laughs> after that shtick, we are treated with a scene of Anne and Daryl in the barn, with Anne having told Daryl that he was quote, wise and cheeky. In the basement, Daryl then decided to show some embarrassing videos of himself to Anne and trusted her not to share them, which he did, as opposed to Sasha actually sharing them should she see them, as we are told by Daryl. And the chapter ended with them having made a pinky promise on trusting each other. I'd say my thoughts on this chapter, but Joe Budden puts it much better than I can. A two pack of ass! All of the problems of the previous chapters persist, there is generally nothing else to say about this chapter other than it's trash with no artwork to speak of, 1 out of 10. This one is based off the episode Girl Time, so it'll be interesting to see how Admiral DTA adapts this one. The chapter starts off with Daryl having finished some deliveries aboard Clipper to the praise of Hop Pop. However, like in canon, Hop Pop and Sprig are an engaged in a spitting contest that Polly also joined in, much to the disgust of Anne and Daryl. Anne decided to take Polly for some girl time, leaving Daryl with Hop Pop and Sprig. Whilst cleaning out Clipper's wings, Cronax and Tint told Daryl that they're going to go to a field to train before Daryl joined them, and they begin the training session. Specifically, they're learning about magical arm sways that technique is required to perform spells. It started off smoothly at first, with Daryl first having pictured the ocean, but then he pictured Hot Pop and Sprig spitting, which made him feel lose his balance and disgust. Cronax then told Daryl to basically not worry about it, which made Daryl appreciate it. Okay, who needs character development, am I right? Once the training session concluded, Daryl went to town to see how Anne and Polly were doing. He then found Polly by herself, feeling upset that Anne was trying to force her to do a bunch of things. Wally then arrived just as Daryl was ordering drinks, and the latter allowed him to join. 
They then have a small burping contest to which Daryl then recalls how he and his father had burping contests back home. Just as Daryl won this one, Anne arrives and began to scold Polly for ditching her. Daryl, being the goody goody good guy he is, stood up for Polly and even yelled at Anne. Wow, we actually had some minor conflict in their relationship. And right after that, the mob turned up and revealed that Hop Hop's IOU cards were useless. And then shit plays exactly the same as canon, except that Daryl, of course, comes up with the idea that Polly wins the spitting contest trophy, yada yada yada. At the end of all that, Daryl offers to take Anne for a ride atop Clipper. As they did so, the Aurora Borealis appeared in the sky, much to the duo's amazement, and Daryl said how this world was amazing despite the dangers. Anne then apologised to Daryl, stating that if she had listened to him instead of Sasha, she wouldn't be in this mess. Daryl then apologised to Anne for not standing up to Sasha, and then Anne went on this whole ass tangent about Daryl such a great loyal person, and how I wished everyone else was like him, and just... <laughs> This chapter was not good. Terrible dialogue, the character development was there, was barely anything, and no artwork to speak of. This does have the redeeming quality of Daryl doing his own thing with the Salamanders for a while. That's good, I guess. But then goes off and leeches it off the main episode. 2 out of 10. It's the episode dating season. Let's get this over with. The chapter began with Tint watching Kronax create a potion. After that, he then comes across Daryl constructing a guitar in Bessie's barn. But not just that, he was able to play it perfectly, with his music attracting the attention of everyone in the barn. Daryl then thanked everyone, but said he couldn't be a musician due to Sasha having told him that he'd have to compete with professional musicians. Kronax reassured him by saying, Beneath every successful person, there are unsuccessful years. Tins then added on that he cannot keep his talents hidden by fear. Anne and Sprig arrived, and revealed that Sprig was developing feelings for a girl. The episode proceeded pretty much the same as canon, with Daryl being introduced to Ivy, and Ivy introducing herself to Daryl, the Salamanders. Later on, whilst the group were dealing with the Love Doves kidnapping Anne, Hot Pop, Polly, and Felicia Sundu, Daryl got the idea to play a love song in his handmade guitar, causing everyone to get lost in the song, including Anne. She then got close to his... <laughs> And Daryl snapped her out of it as Daryl prepared to defend the group from the Love Doves. Then Sprig and Ivy came down and knocked the doves out. On the way home, Sprig admitted that he had feelings for Ivy and told Daryl that his guitar skills were awesome, to which Daryl said that it was nothing. Some more campy dialogue later, and the chapter ended with Daryl walking her down to the basement whilst holding her hand without her noticing and then heading to Bessie's barn for bed. Boring chapter. Nothing really much to see here if you already watched the episode, and the Annex Daryl progression isn't really getting any better here. If anything, it's getting cringier by the minute. And this chapter does nothing but cement the fact that Daryl is a Gary Stu, if not contribute to it. No artwork too, for the third chapter in a row. Come on man, 1 out of 10. It's Anne vs Wild, and I kid you not, the chapter goes almost exactly the same as canon, and I don't mean like somewhat altered, I meant word for word, ripped out of the original episode. There, there are some things of note. Daryl looked at the photo of him and Sasha before he looked at the photo of Anne. He then covered Sasha in the photo and said to himself, you know what, Kronax do be speaking facts. We then cut to the fight with the Mud Men where nothing changed except for Daryl intent using fire magic before Anne used the plant bomb. And apologised for not telling the truth to the planters, but also apologised to Daryl for not listening to him. He's like, mate, we get it, this is a power fantasy for you. After that, it's revealed that the salamanders have officially moved in. Sprig and Tint were now roommates, which got them excited despite the fact they barely, if at all, interacted so far. Kronax is now in the study of Hop Hop, and Anne and Daryl were in the place. After the moving was done, Anne and Daryl revealed the music box to everyone. All but Kronax recognised it, the latter saying the memory was still fuzzy. The chapter then ended with Kronax and Hot Pop arguing about whether or not they should tell Anne and Daryl everything about the box, with Kronax finishing it by saying, Those who remain in the dark fail to see the light. Shut the fuck up, you fucking dream boy. This chapter, as you can tell by the summary, was genuinely terrible. There was almost nothing new for this chapter, and the dialogue certainly didn't help, and the artwork just looks like hot ass. Like, how is he holding this? And here you can tell this is definitely not made for more than one person. One out of ten. Shit chapter. You know the episode Contain Jan? Yeah, it's that, but with Daryl's OCs. The chapter started off with Anne and Daryl looking outside at the rain from the basement. The two decided to sleep to the sound of rain. This caused Daryl to dream him dancing within a cave. The water droplets morphed into a faceless figure, and just before he could touch it, he and Anne were woken up by the sound of Hop Hop demanding that they get to work. 
In the main room, he explained that they have to get the crops covered up before the storm destroys them. Sprague suggested that they could use magic to maybe calm the storm, but that ain't possible because... reasons. And then faked being sick to get out of work, you know the episode. Outside, Daryl told Chronix that he knows she's faking sick and that mocha lattes are just a dream from home, with Chronix saying that he knows that and that, quote, Her health is her responsibility! The group then headed back inside, now all feeling ill and Anne feeling like crap for faking it. Lucky for Tint and Chronix though, Salamanders can perform a ritual to heal themselves. Wow. Whilst Daryl stayed in the basement, he fought back to the time to know sick back on Earth. His pop mother fed him soup, and his father read him stories. Keep in mind that it was established, or rather just told, that his father was a commercial pilot and his mother was a nurse. Commercial pilots work a maximum of 10 hours a day, according to the FAA, with nurses working 12 hours a day. How they managed to find time to take care of Daryl and his sisters is beyond me. Meanwhile, Anne and Marcy brought him homework so he doesn't miss school, because of course he's that kind of person, and then came into the basement to place a wet towel on Daryl's forehead. He then brought up that Sasha never visited him when he was ill, and clarified that Sasha didn't want to get sick. When Anne was leaving the basement, Daryl went on a whole house tangent about how Anne is so special to him and that he loves her, not realising that Anne actually heard him. Later on, Anne gave Daryl his soup, just as Tintin and Kronax came out of their healing bubbles. The rest of the chapter goes the same as canon with the planters, thinking they have red leg, and Anne goes to the mineral lake with Daryl and Tint, using vision magic to watch them. Afterwards, Tint gave off a rundown about how he managed to gain magic powers. According to Kronax, magic runs in their family, all started from when Tint's great aunt Alexia fell in love as a soldier. Ever since then, all kinds of magic, from elemental to healing and others, but mentioned there are some kind of magic that are forbidden. Bunch of shit later, and the chapter ended with Anne pondering if she and Daryl could be more than just friends. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ, this chapter is awful. Awful dialogue, awful characterization, and just awfully boring. The one redeeming quality is that the only piece of artwork for this chapter genuinely looks pretty good. And some original poses too. Other than that, 2 out of 10. Mid-season finale, just 8 more chapters of season 1. The chapter began with Daryl recalling the events of Lily Pad Thai and Planters Last Stand, both of which happened off page. Cut to Anne, Daryl, the Planters and Salamanders at the store and an elderly frog wanted the last mushroom and so Daryl lets her have it. Only for her to call him a scarecrow right away. This is then followed up by Daryl awkwardly saying, My name is Daryl Loyally, it's like for fuck's sake, can you just not please? Daryl and Anne headed back outside, with Daryl having whined about why people, quote, Could it be nicer like me, like please shut the fuck up, you are getting on my nerves. He then cheered Anne up, which then led to Anne hugging him and asking why people couldn't be more nice like him. Suddenly the toads arrive to collect taxes, Anne joined them much to Daryl's dismay, you know the episode, and somehow Daryl fixed every single house that the toads messed up via magic with zero explanation as to how he managed to learn that, although that really doesn't surprise me the slightest. But oh my god, this chapter is so trash. Skip to the part in which the toads arrived at the planter farm, Anne defected from the toads and she and Daryl fought, with Kronax having fired a wind blast at them before Daryl formed a shield to protect him. After one of the toads disarmed and injured Anne, Daryl's staff glowed brightly before he casted a massive fireball at the toads before he casted two lightning bolts at them. Tint and Sprig arrived to expose Toad's door for stealing the taxes. Daryl signed Anne's cast with BHFF, Best Human Friend Forever, and the chapter ended with Daryl recounting the events of the chapter, wondering what will happen if his anger came out like that again, and what will dawn about him and Anne finding Sasha and Marcy and returning home, blah blah blah. Man, this chapter was lame. Dialogue was poor, there wasn't really much to this, and also another random spell out of nowhere. The only piece of artwork for this chapter isn't that great either, quality is inconsistent, and Kronax standing there and smirking looks really tacked on. 2 out of 10. It's the episode of the same name. Let's crack through this. Much like in the episode, as a result of the Planter family having lost their stand, they now resort to stuff akin to a black market, and it's also revealed Hot Pop has feelings for a frog named Sylvia Sundu, and, like in canon, there was a poster for a dance leader, and that meant the perfect opportunity for Hot Pop to ask out Sylvia. Tint also suggested that it would also be the perfect opportunity for Daryl to ask out Anne, but Daryl declined, explaining that he is still technically in a relationship with Sasha, and that he has to remain loyal. I mean, true, because that's basic human decency, and he's second name is literally loyalty. 
Back at the planter farm, Daryl explained his woes to Bessie before he acknowledged that talking to a snail like this is a sign of him going insane. I'll admit, I actually had a light chuckle at this part. After Hop Hop didn't want to be disturbed, he then went to the basement to see if Anne could help him de-stress. Her solution was to put on some music to which Daryl danced to. As Daryl was dancing, Hop Hop barged in and asked if they could help him dance. Cue Hop Hop failing the dance lessons like in canon, the dance happened. Hop Hop and Sylvia act all goofy, you know the story. During Hop Hop and Sylvia's dance, Daryl looked at the photo of him and Sasha. Kronax then told Daryl, Daryl, you're not going to find happiness if you dwell in the past. You've come a long way since this past month, and that's coming from someone who's been around much longer than anyone else. You say Sasha makes all the choices, but what choices will you make? Just listen to your heart. Here's one of the most irritating fucking OCs in human history, my god. Daryl then stuffed a photo of Sarge in his pocket and asked Anne to a dance, in which he agreed to. They danced for a bit, and the chapter ended with Anne saying that if things don't work out with Sasha, she'll be there for them. And what a way to contradict your own second name in this fanfiction's frickin' title. But this isn't really the most egregious thing he does in this fanfiction, oh, so we'll get to that in a bit. The dialogue isn't as bad as previous chapters, but it's still by no means great, and like I said, I did have a small chuckle at Daryl rambling to Bessie, I'll give it that. There's only one piece of artwork for this chapter, which looks okay, I guess. 3 out of 10 either way. It's trip to the archives. The chapter begins with Daryl having finished a delivery aboard Clipper. The group were preparing for a trip to the archives, much to Sprig's dismay, and everything happens exactly as it was in the same episode. So let's skip most of it. Anne and Kronak suggested that they could get out via the skylights, and unlike Cannon, they didn't need to stack stuff to reach the skylights as Daryl used his levitation magic. Why didn't he use it when they were dealing with the Zappapedes is completely beyond me. She got stuck, and then when Daryl tries to use the spell to get Anne down, he got flung up and stuck next to her. Oh, God. After Daryl recalled to when he got his head stuck during the trip to France, some Kaikeda. I, I generally cannot spell that insect. Daryl used magic to turn them into metal, which apparently didn't do anything, and the amphibians escaped using the pipes, and everyone was pissed at Sprig. After the hole collapsed, Daryl used levitation magic to get everyone out, and that concluded the chapter. Lame chapter, lame dialogue, nothing interesting throughout, and no artwork, boring chapter, 1 out of 10. It's the episode Family Fishing Trip. Let's get this over with. The chapter begins with Daryl recalling the events of Snow Day, cracking Miss Croker, a night at the end, and warning him Anne. Daryl then started to tear up and pulled up a photo of him and an old man on his phone, that old man being his grandfather. Anne then barged in and told Daryl that they were ready to leave for the planter's annual fishing trip. Same shit as the cannon happens, and Kronax caught Daryl just staring out into the blue on the backside of the ship, the latter explaining that they brought memories from home. Anne failed at power sailing, much like in canon, before she started dancing to some music that reminded Daryl of his grandfather, causing him to go towards the lower deck. Anne, Sprig, and Tint find Daryl sitting on a crate with bloodshot eyes. He then told them about his grandfather, his love for sailing, and his last days alive, with Daryl being one of the last people to say goodbye to him, and that is why he can't really look at the ocean or boat without thinking of him. And it's why he was so quiet back there, because... Oh, fuck, I cannot take this scene seriously, it's so fucking funny. Anne, Tin, and Sprig assured Daryl that they'll always be there for him. Daryl said he feels like the luckiest boy alive. Oh my god, this is so fucking corny, it hurts. The rest of the chapter for a while follows pretty much the same as it did in canon, except Daryl is the one who killed the crab, which the group later ate at home. At the end, Daryl played his guitar that caused his staff to generate a musical aura? Bro, this is campy as shit, what the fuck? Daryl then pictures his grandfather and grandmother dancing to the music before the chapter ended with him saying that he should do something nice for Anne. This chapter has an example of Nam, something that is intended to be serious and or emotionally charged, but ends up being extremely fun. <laughs> the poor dialogue, combined with everything else in this fanfiction beforehand, and the fact that Daryl isn't really that good of a character to begin with, doesn't make you feel bad for him losing his grandfather. Other than that, the chapter doesn't really have anything going for it, not even artwork. 2 out of 10, the one point being for the fact that it's just unintentionally funny. The first chapter since Insect Among Us, and yes, it has maybe in parentheses. We start with Daryl reminiscing on everything that has happened to him in the story so far. He then went on to say that since Anne was doing all this nice stuff for him, he should return the favour. He then overheard Hot Pop and Kronax arguing about the Calamity Box before he knocked on their door. 
Alerted by this, Hop Pop asked Kronax that he never brings this up, with Kronax replying, You can't just keep hiding this forever! Please just shut the fuck up. After that, Daryl asked Hop Pop and Kronax that they get Sprig, Tint, and Polly here. Once they were all gathered, Daryl said that he needs their help in organising something nice for Anne, and you could just tell they took this really seriously by this piece of artwork, which totally isn't just that static poses stacked together, and it totally doesn't look creepy. Jesus Christ. He said that this isn't a date, but sort of is. Sprig pointed out that Sasha is Daryl's girlfriend, to which Daryl acknowledged and said that this thing he planned with Anne, more so just hanging out, and gave off a brief rundown of what he planned via illusion magic. First, he planned to take her on a flight aboard Clipper to see the Aurora Borealis. Then he wanted to sit with her by the lake, and finally, have dinner, and requested the plan source to help with the last one and for it to start an hour past noon. After a while, with him and Anne having finished chores for the day, he then asked if she wanted to hang out for the evening, and that made her blush slightly. He said it wasn't a day, although the fix stated that he really wanted it to be. Cut to it being past sunset, with Daryl having placed a saddle onto Clipper for him and Anne. Once the duo were ready, they climbed onto Clipper and ascended into the sky. Up there, they spotted the Aurora Borealis, but not only that, they also spotted extinct Earth Megafauna up there... somehow. After that, they descended towards a watering hole near the farm. Once landing there, Daryl told Anne that just because they were so focused on finding their friends and returning home, they didn't take the time to appreciate Amphibia in all her glory, not noticing that both their hands were touching. Next, the two went to get food at a table set by either Sprig, Harp Harp, Parley, Tint or Cronax. This vantage point allowed Daryl to waffle on some more about how cool this place is. Then, Hop Hop and Cronax arrived to serve the two Thai noodles, but in Amphibia style, with crickets and lava. Sprig and Tint come out to play Marcy's parody of Blunt and Knives. After that song number, Daryl and Anne started blushing like crazy after seeing how close they were to each other. Fucking <laughs> God, me praise. After the whole quote unquote date, Daryl admitted that he had more fun with Anne the past month than he did with Sasha the past year, whilst recalling all the times that Sasha mistreated him. That caused his hands to glow slightly red and storm clouds together, but that stopped when Anne grabbed his hand and thus calmed him down, and answered Daryl's question of him being with Sasha till, still with the reason that he sees good in people. Anne then said that anyone would be lucky to have a friend like Daryl, and who's saying this? Daryl? Anne? Sprig? Who? Oh, but for God's sake, the formatting is so bad, I don't know who's saying what half the time. What the hell? After that shtick, Daryl and Anne took a selfie, labelled it as HBFF, and the chapter ended with Cronax and Hot Pop once again arguing about the music box and the eternal staff. Good lord, this chapter was bad. The dialogue makes me want to puke, the formatting issues are especially egregious, and the artwork here is, well... Okay, I guess. Just reused poses and stolen renders. This one looks alright, though. I'll say that. 2 out of 10. It's combat camp, so let's keep this brief. Hop Pop dropped Anne, Sprig, Polly, Daryl, and Tint at a supposed daycare, which caused Anne to whine about how much teachers suck, but unsurprisingly, Daryl ended up being in the right. It actually turns out that this was a combat camp, and Anne was excited, but Daryl felt edgy. Oh my god, he's gonna say it's slow, don't do that! Daryl picked up some gauntlets when they were choosing weapons, and everyone but Anne passed the obstacle courses. But of course, Daryl kept watching her to make sure she actually got through. One thing I want to bring up is Anne's line of Blech, that's the corniest thing I've ever heard! kept in, and that line can essentially sum up almost every piece of dialogue in this entire season thus far. Cut to when Anne is sitting on top of the tower and wanted to be alone, but Daryl decided to sit next to her and lean on her shoulder. Gee, do batteries not exist for this guy? Tritonia gave him a bottle of food, which only Daryl ate, whilst Tritonia and Anne had a convo that essentially went the same as canon, except of course Daryl butted in. The next day, Tritonia tripped the group into robbing the train like a cannon, but of course Daryl and Tint managed to know this right off the bat, because you know, Daryl knows what's right, and he's a hard worker, and he's a nice person that knows all the magic powers that he gets out of fucking no- Whilst the others prepared to rob the train, Daryl and Tint warned the drivers about what was happening before he then cursed the ruby. Same shit as Katanen happens, except that Daryl used a curse on the ruby to freeze Tritonio until the authorities came and arrested him. Chapter then ended with Anne and Daryl storing the weapons and thinking they could be useful later before Daryl went to begin practicing plant magic. Boring chapter where nothing interesting happens with no artwork to speak of, and it's one of the worst chapters of this fanfiction thus far. 1 out of 10. <laughs> Why just children of the sport, but it could be an entire year, you know? And the chapter goes almost exactly the same as Kanan. <laughs> Jesus Christ, why? 
Pop Pop gets pissed at the kid messing about and breaking his boat that he was building, but Kronax repaired it with magic, so it's all good. But when Hop Hop was going to get more supplies from Loggle, Bessie began acting up and gave the planters a ticket, but Daryl paid it off so all hunky dory. Then they broke Hop Hop's ship again, which pissed him off. He then used the purple loose whilst they were sleeping, all the while Kronax was watching him. Hop Pop excused himself via telling Kronax that it was just only one day, the kid's actual zombie like, creeping Hop Hop and Kronax out. Kronax then tells Hop Hop that I, I don't know what you did to make those kids zombified, but I'm going to find out. And that was a big deal because it was his nephew who was involved. Hop Hop tried again the next night, gets confronted by Kronax who told him that those were spores, and then cue Anne and Daryl breaking out of the basement with Anne's eyes going purple and Daryl's eyes having turned purple and looking like they have purple marker drawn around them. I mean, that's what the artwork shows. Then Sprig, Polly and Tint also come out infected. Gary and the other frogs introduce themselves, they swarm Hop Hop and Kronax. Kronax distracted them and gets infected himself in order to buy Hop Hop enough time. Once nearby Bessie's farm, Hop Hop turns around to see Kronax infected. Then Daryl took the lead and began playing fucking Thriller by Michael Jackson and everyone dances along, you cannot make this up. Hop Hop then got Bessie to eat all the mushrooms and free everyone of the spores. He then turned around to see the group pissed at him for mind controlling them. Kronak scolded him, although Daryl apologised for being so reckless. Some more thing later, and that ended the chapter. Name chapter of one piece of mediocre artwork. That's all I can say, 1 out of 10. Anne has been officially declared Frog of the Year, and like in canon, wanted to celebrate it her own way. Toadstool protested, but Daryl stood up for her, saying that she's a better frog than he'll ever be. Anne agreed and said that she'll put on a party so big that it'll blow their minds. Daryl elaborated that it'll be amazing and not literally kill them. Back home, Anne assigned roles to each of the group. Hop up a Kronax are entertainment. Polly and Tint make sure who gets in and who gets out, even though Polly is more than capable of doing that on her own, but I digress. And finally, Sprig is to be the spectacle, in which he confesses to Ivy. Meanwhile in the basement, Daryl looked at the photo of him and Sasha, after reminiscing how much of a jackass she was to him for like the nth time and some encouragement from Tint, Daryl decided that he will confess to Anne today and move on from Sasha. It's here I'd like to point out there are only 4 pieces of artwork for this chapter for reasons that will become increasingly apparent later on. The party begins and like in canon started going south, except of course Daryl is the one who pointed out things went south. He does most of the work saving the party whilst all Anne did was tame the mud skipper. Fuck's sake, since when was it Daryl of the year? But lads, brace yourself. <coughs> Here it comes. After Sprig and Ivy confess, we see Daryl sitting down next to Anne and after she witnessed it, and after some more shit talking about Sasha, Daryl confessed that he liked Anne. This confession caused both their limbs to turn into literal noodles, judging by the artwork, and then they touch hands. <laughs> oh no, not a stolen Anne render. And they kiss. On the left. Oh, 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 that lips look like chicken beaks. It looks wrong. Not to mention that Admiral DTA clearly loved writing this, as he described it as being quote warm and gentle with a magical aura in their chest. Just get, get off my throat. And the chapter ended with Sasha turning up. Daryl in his daylight color scheme, and Sasha introducing the toads as they arrived in Wartwood. Good fucking lord, this chapter was trash. Daryl hoarded up Anne's spotlight, things remaining nearly identical, and of course the obvious, Daryl and Anne's confession. Not only was it executed in a mediocre way, but it's also wrong on so many levels. Daryl here is still technically in a relationship with Sasha. Daryl, knowing he was still technically dating Sasha, confessed to and kissed Anne on the lips. You know what that constitutes as? Cheating. Daryl Loyalty 8 is a cheater. And that makes the second part of his name, Loyally 8, completely meaningless. And like I said, the artwork is complete doo doo. 1 out of 10. Here we are, folks, the final chapter of season 1. Sasha has arrived with the Toads, and Sasha is introduced to the Planters and Salamanders by Anne and Daryl, respectively. She and Grime invite the Frogs of Wartswood to a banquet at Toad Tower and gives Anne, Daryl, the Planters, and Salamanders VIP privileges like in canon. Sasha acted all lovey-dovey towards Daryl, much to his discomfort, and queried about the Eternal Star. They arrived at Toad Tower with the frogs plus Tint and Kronax being the banquet, with Anne and Daryl upstairs in Sasha's room. Now being served are replicas of Earth food, such as fried chicken, burgers, condiments like ketchup, and other things. Whilst Anne was having a shower, Sasha then explained what happened when she arrived, how she earned the respect of the Toads via fighting off giant herrings. Not herons, herrings. There's a difference, mind you. 
before she then acted all lovey-dovey towards Daryl again. Daryl appreciated it before he said that they needed to talk. But then Anne came out of the shower and now it was Sasha's turn, allowing him and Anne some alone time. Daryl explained to Anne that he no longer recognised Sasha anymore and that back home she always listened to him. So what you're saying, that half of what you said about Sasha in the prior chapters was nothing more than complete crass? Be consistent please. Oh, and speaking of consistency, the artwork <coughs> took a 90 degree nosedive down a cliff because this looks like trash. Inconsistent quality, reused poses, and it's only going to get worse from here. Afterwards, Sasha gets out of the shower, then Daryl, and now they start to talk about some things. In particular, the rebellion inspired by Hot Pop. You know, the episode Hot Popular in which he ran for election against Mayor Toadstool? Yeah, that never got brought up in this fanfiction until now. Not even a mention. Anyway, Sasha revealed that once they got rid of Hop Hop and the Rebellion, the turtle helped them find Marcy and a way home, and that the Bankay was simply a way to lure them all in, with Kronax and Tint being nothing more than simple collateral damage. Anne and Daryl quickly excused themselves to the bathroom, which was actually them trying to warn the frogs, Tint and Kronax about Sasha's true intentions. Same shit as canon happens except no boom shrooms. Tower collapsed differently, as we'll see shortly, and we are now at top of Toe Tower with Anne and Daryl confronting Sasha. Their pleas fell on deaf ears, looks like shit. And Sasha used her end of discussion tactic towards Anne. Daryl gave a small reason you suck speech towards Sasha which apparently made her a loss for words, even though in reality Sasha would have probably snapped back with her own reasons. Sasha tried convincing Daryl and Anne that this is the best for both of them even if it meant killing Hot Pop. This finally broke the thread and Daryl officially broke up with Sasha, destroying their photo. Or supposed to be, because in this photo, it's just a void, but here, in the next piece, like, it's there. Did Daryl erase the ink, but then change his mind last second, but then change his mind again? Who knows? Then he kissed and right. After which, some more corny shit is said. Tint then stole half of what Sprig said to Sasha, and then it was Anne and Daryl versus Sasha. Anne won, but Grimes prepared to kill Hop Hop anyway. This was enough for Daryl as his eyes began to glow red, as did his hands and staff. A storm began to form as his mouth also glowed red for some reason. Kronax explained that It's the battle to eternal staff! His anger is channeling into a storm too dangerous, too big to control! The storm was so powerful that it caused the tower to collapse. Anne managed to calm Daryl down as the tower began to continue to collapse. Even after the storm, the tower continued to fall apart. Sasha faked her death, Anne and Daryl have a mental breakdown, and the amphibians comfort them. The next day, everyone is now home, Anne and Daryl and the frogs and Salamanders were forlorn about it's going to be a grand adventure, they'll find Sasha and Marcy for like the nth time, yada yada yada, I do not care, that ends the season finale. Man, this chapter was fucking trash. From Daryl in his OCs hoarding the spotlight to the cliché dialogue, this chapter was an absolute chore to get through. The artwork is unsurprisingly trash, with inconsistent quality, reused poses, and also this pose looks incredibly goofy. 1 out of 10. In conclusion, Season 1 of Loyalty Among Worlds was abysmal. Firstly, the characters. Other than Anne and Daryl, there was virtually next to no chemistry between the canon characters and the OCs. All Hop Hop and Kronax did was argue. Kronax never spoke to Polly once, and neither did Sprig to Kronax. Kronax is one of the most irritating characters ever and is an example of how not to do the wise old man trip with his corny, ham fisted lines. Tint is simply just a sprig wannabe, not said. Daryl, as a character, is incredibly dull with the personality of wet cement. He's always right, despite being a fucking cheater, always a hard worker, and always get magical powers seemingly out from thin air. Speaking of magic, half the shit that happened would have never either not happened or been dealt with much easier had Daryl simply had more than five brain cells. The formatting also contributes to this season's downfall. You Speak A New Line exists for a reason, and without it, it makes the story much harder to follow. The artwork is hit or miss. Sometimes it can be pretty good, other times it is god awful. If I had to choose the best this fix had to offer, it was Be Insect Among Us, as it presented some pretty cool ideas, the dialogue wasn't too bad, if anything was kind of tolerable, and I thought it was a decent chapter overall, well, relatively speaking. If I've had to choose one redeeming quality about any one of the characters, I would say that Daryl's arc about him being loyal to either Sasha or Anne was an interesting idea, if not executed absolutely horrendously. Overall, this season gets a 3 out of 10, a pretty terrible start. But that does not answer the question of whether or not this fanfiction deserves the title as Worst Amphibia Fanfiction, as to really find out, we'd have to go through Season 2 and Season 3 next. But until then, I will see you next time.